There's a new kid on the block, Holly Rood Distillery in Edinburgh, and I was very, very pleasantly surprised at the welcome I was given and the products they're making. Made in Edinburgh. So this is one of those interesting new uh, distilleries. We make the spirit, the city makes us. And they, of course, produce a lot of gin at the moment, um, but their heart actually beats for whiskey. So this was um, the reason I was there. So, test, learn, improve, repeat. So we're going to actually see Stuart in a moment, and he's going to guide us through the whiskey distillery. They use Simpsons malt and Chris malt there, and it was a fantastic tour. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Now, before I dive into everything, I'm going to assume that at least one of you doesn't know what single malt scotch actually means. So single means that our distillery is married to our It means it's a singular distillery, singular product, singular setup, singular goal. When it comes to malt, it means malted barley. Only barley is being used when it comes to the malting stage, and it's only ever malted barley, no unused malted barley. Irish whiskey we use unmalted barley as well. I believe they call it a different type of whiskey entirely. The name escapes me admittedly, but I'm Scottish, not Irish, so that's my justification. Now, Scottish just means Scottish. You can get single malt Irish, single malt Japanese. It's just to make sure that what you're drinking is known for being a tremendously delicious Scottish product. And that's why we put scotch at the end of names of things, you know, or at the beginning. So scotch whiskey, scotch eggs, scotch pies, scotch pancakes. Scotch tea is actually Canadian, though, so it's a bit fun to say. <laughs> so even if it's got tart on it, it is usually scotch. You know, kilts. Now, when it comes to the first and second stages, which is the malting and the milling, we don't do this. We don't need to. It is quite a lot of stuff to have companies do it for you. Those that do it themselves have been doing it for a very long time, and it's kind of a, if it isn't broke, we'll fix it. Malting is about triple meat. It's about triple the barley. It's about actually getting the starch, the fuel of that barley inside, and it's getting that energy going by steeping the grain in that water over several days. So it's great, but we don't want it to go too much. We don't want to fuel the barley. So we dry the grain. And how we dry the grain is where our experiments begin. So traditionally, you would quite commonly use a kiln. A kiln is placing an oven underneath or a forest floor on which the grains are now sitting. This is an option of fuel source. In its natural state, it's as delicious as it looks. <laughs> <Not. But, laughs> I can the amount of time I've seen people try to smell this when I'm not looking is quite funny. Uh, but yeah, so in its natural state, it's useless, apart from being a very good takeaway. But as a fuel source, it's not bad. We use it as fires in people's houses and things like that uh, in the middle of nowhere in Scotland, but we can use it as a fuel source in the kiln, fueling that kiln, and when you release the smoke from this, the properties of that smoke's flavour will soak into the grain because it's incredibly soft at this point. The grain it soaks in anything that's exposed to it, and this is where things get really good. This heat from bulbs, P E A T, and bulbs are different all over the world. It's not like they're all different all over the world. Isla, the capital of basically, are actually closer to Ireland than they are to Scotland. To give an idea of how far into the water <coughs> Ireland is, so they have a lot of seaweed in their seaweed in the peat. This helps the actual its intensity that they're in. Plus the greater out proportion of smoke that they actually expose the grain during the duration. That's great. The lots of opportunity. We explore their options, explore their intensity, but it's not just their we use. We use Aberdeen share peat as well, which I think is more of a barbecue kind of smell and taste to it. Really interesting a nice peculiar texture that we've achieved as well. It's not just simply oh it's smoke, it tastes taste the smoke. It's a bit more than that. Kind of how diluting juice, if you drink nothing but diluting juice in the water, it's going to be quite overly concentrated. But the more you add of water, it changes things. Same goes for whiskey in general. It's all about this kind of like exposure to things. And then the intensity of the work. Now, that's one option, which is optional, as I said. The others are where things get really good. So, our crystal malt, our mm. chocolate malt, never not crystal malt, okay? Chocolate. Uh, crystal malt is toasted, and chocolate malt is roasted. And to give a bit more of a relatable example why we have to be careful when these are done. When you're roasting a coffee bean to achieve where it is, because it's in the natural state of coffee beans green, it is losing caffeine. But very little, but to the starch, we actually lose a lot of it when we are roasting. So we have to be careful. But this is where it's commonly known as the good news is a little bit long way. <laughs> Guinness, to give an example, 5% of Guinness is only chocolate. But that comes.
color and that classic flavor of stuff that this has is from there. So it's great for that. But the craft styles where more festival sneakers have more trouble. But yield is effective. So this is not a big deal. We usually are on about 10 percent being of chocolate sneakers, the moss, etc. We have gone as high as 30. Ooh. Recently we have gone as high as 18, because we thought that's a nice place to be part of our experiment. But 30 is when we were still exploring ourselves and we were building. But then we will be some of the first ones we will be releasing, so I'm particularly excited to because we like to start with Now, crystal malt very commonly used a lot here. It's about adding sweetness, crystal malt, caramel, crystallized sugars to make caramel. Out of it. It's all about that kind of sweetness. It's great. But then we use only so much of it. And we've got different combinations as well. So this is what's been made this week. We've got a heavy island peat. So I wouldn't be surprised that was like 50 uh, parts per million. And we've got Marathon, which is the heritage malt, which is really helpful for the interesting textures. And we've also got Amber which is a slightly less sweet version of like Christmas. So it's more mm -hmm. but it's got more of a, I don't know saying, like kind of more of a brownie red kind of sweetness, if you get what I mean. So it's kind of really interesting. And then we've got the yeast, which we'll be adding into soon. We've got a Norwegian ale yeast right here. And we've got this little yeast to help assist it to get the alcohol that we need. And some interesting flavors on the side itself as well. But no matter what, the grains need to be milked. So once that's done for us, it will look like this. And this was called the grist, G-R-I-S-T. The grist is then introduced to the container behind me here, the mash tun, which is a boiler, basically. It looks super fancy. If you look inside, it looks like a big food mixer with a sieve at the bottom. That's not wrong, because it does mix stuff and it does have a sieve. But the water is introduced inside there, and the water is going to leave the acid and sour characteristic sugar, early enzymes, to the sugar, and it will drain through. The amount of water we use is six and a half thousand liters against 1.25 tons. And we go through 15 tons a week. And after this process has been achieved, we don't need this anymore. In single malt anyway. So single malt, we don't need it anymore. It's now called the draft, D-R-A-F-F. -F, and the draft came to farmer and his cattle. As many do, very common practice for a very long time. Now we're technically being broke with this. But there is also other options. There's other breweries, a select a quantity of Charity basically takes all the spent draft breweries and makes bread for the homeless. So there's different things you can do with it, even bulk biscuits. Yeah. But this whole goal, job is just to get those sugars and have them drain through with that liquid, which is the wort, W O R T, which is taken to the next stage. That stage is the yeast. When it was getting done in the mash tun, it smelled like a cheese and ham toasted. Yeah. So basically, toasted cheese and ham. Right? <laughs> and then, like, and it, it, that's how I smell when it comes to peat being an implement. It just gets really interesting. But yeah, so this container was filled on the 4th, so it's been fermented for four days. The industry average is about 3 to 5, but this is nothing compared to what we've done in the past. We've gone as high as 16 days in wow. our fermentation. We measure fermentation in the hours, that's how little it is compared to like beer. <laughs> uh, so beer measure the day, that's not correctly. But when it comes to this stage, we are experimenting. This is where we significantly pay attention to the rest of the world. Not just in whiskey, but many different things. So, for example, yeast place. You know? So over here, just a visual aid for you. We've got distillers yeast, the fruits and spices and floral notes that ate cheese. But beer yeast is known for a lot of citrus fruits. This is why also beer yeast are living yeast in for that case. They do have a better achievement of the fruits. Wine yeast, as you can see there as well. But it's not just these three. Tropical wine yeast as well. And also rum, sourdough, sake, and Beyond. We're even creating our own bespoke yeast. And when it comes to beer yeast as well, it's not just you know Norwegian and local ones from our history. We're using Belgian, German, American. It's whatever's out there that we've seen in a published article. This is where we really do not ignore the world. It's all about seeing what's been achieved. Because we're not the only ones experimenting with different types of yeast. Like Nick Neenan Distillery have recently just released their Huntress, which is using rum yeast. You know, when we got the rum yeast, they were telling us, don't tell anyone you're using this because it's so niche, no one's doing it. <laughs> Trust me, turns out, that will work. But no, that's the thing, it's fine. Because we even sell their product in a shop. We're not about this whole like competitive, like, because everyone is different, especially nowadays with this thing. We're all coming up with experiments that no one else has even thought of their mind of doing, not just ourselves. So this is a lot fun. This is my favorite part of the process because we're creating those congeners that gives these flavors, that achieves these congeners that exist in these actual fruits. It's all this fun exciting time and on a rare occasion I get to try it. <laughs> but it's not like the safest thing to drink. <laughs> so uh, it's like 
I guess I we got had a we had a cast one that basically I find it tastes like lefty blonde beer, but also with tropical fruits. Like there's a kind of like a have you ever heard of a drink called Lilt? It's mm-hmm. a tropical fruit drink, and it's basically that combined with lefty blonde. I love this. It's really nice. I, I, I wanted to sit down, but I was working at the time, so I had to like just get on my job. But it's this exciting kind of experiment you can do. But as I said, like duration, 16 days have got as long as, so we don't really have an average of fermentation and a combination as well. So there's a new mixed spirit that you'll get to try later on. That's a combination of beer yeast and distillers yeast. It's showing them together as that one's showing there, but that one has the intention. Sometimes we just use distillers yeast to ensure a yield. Because we need to get 8-10% alcohol, and not every beer yeast and wine yeast will get us there. But distillers yeast are good for us. But no matter what, we've got our beer created. That's what we're doing here. We're creating a beer. Our wash packs are total in six because this process takes so long. And then our taking to the next stage, our distillation. The reason why we're able to do this level of experimentation is that we're not the only ones doing it for us. We actually have a doctorate student doing it for us. And not all of it, so we do the research ourselves, but uh, she's actually doing a lot of our research development, not just in what the yeast does, but how well the grains work at different roasting things, and also the influence of the wood as well. So all the little things that would take an entire person's job just sitting down, doing the research, yeah. doing the experiments, she's doing it for us as part of her doctorate. And she will be, once she finishes her doctorate, a whiskey doctor. <laughs> as well, which I think is the coolest thing ever. She's an yeah. absolute genius. Yeah. But yeah, so she's able to really find out in the finer details, the finer science for us, like what will work, what won't work. And with our experiments, 95% is known to be fit, but the proof's in the pudding in the end. Sometimes we don't have things to work out as we just wanted them to. But luckily, we've actually, we've actually been quite lucky. A lot of things we've been trying to do, we have achieved. Great. When it comes to the stills, we are, of course, of copper. All metals plot the impurities when it comes to having extra casing for your still. We have stainless steel for our wash bags because it's easier cleaning. Wooden ones are perfectly fine, that's why a lot of people still use them, but they are a lot bigger and not harder to get through shapes. And we are doing a lot of whiskey, so by having it easier cleaning with our wash bags, we have no crossover of the flavors. Yeah, half the distiller's job is cleaning, the other half mm. of the paperwork. So you can imagine how much fun it is when you're trying to make whiskey on top of that. But a very important thing to remember before I dive into this part, the wash backs is where the alcohol is created. Stills don't create alcohol, they extract and purify it. So copper being the best for doing this, they known for about 6,000 years, is your big couple days. Um, it's all about leading into that heritage, that history that we developed as a species. We've had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people fail and succeed for us to know now what's the right way, what's the wrong way, what's dangerous, what's successful, etc. Now, copper will be pulling out impurities. But the gin still that you saw upstairs, that actually doesn't need to be copper tin because it's already got clean alcohol. So a gin still like that, or a gin still in general, will last forever as long as pressure and bolts keep themselves wrong. But copper will take a battery when it comes to a whiskey still because we're developing our spirit. And that's the way you notice that it's a lot more of a kind of a muddy, darker hue than the gin stills. Now we have a reflux built here. This is all about encouraging contact. So all about having more of a co- actual contact of copper, because there is more of it. But also we have gathering of vapors right here as well. It's all about that reflux, about getting it to go back down and go up again, but encouraging copper contact. Now our still is 5,000 liters, as it says just here. 5,000 liters is not a big still. But our still is the second tallest in the entire country. <laughs> this means greater ratio of height and ratio of interaction with copper for what we're actually involved with our product. So it's quite handy. Glimmerangi are the tallest, but here's where it gets really good. We are the tallest by volume. That's how much of the significance our height is, our actual capacity, because it's quite small, but very tall, seven meters. We would go taller, but this is a listed building. We can't go higher than the roof. Even the capacity was actually lifted by the doorway that it had to come through downstairs, which shaped the entire capacity for the entire production. So we hate that doorway. <laughs> we could have, could have a bigger still, even though we don't have much space anyway, so it's probably for the best. Now windows are rare on a still. Mm-hmm. You want more proper contact as much as possible, so having a window is a bit redundant. Uh, but this is where it's actually quite cool, because when the distilling is going along nicely, you, the bubbling effect is hypnotic. Now, this will get even better. I'm going to get a torch, so you guys can see what's actually inside. So when it comes to a still, in our case, we have a radiator inside there, which is powered by steam, which is fueled by gas. And have a look inside. You can actually see the radiator itself. This kind of looks like an old style looking radiator you'd expect in a house. 
Mm -hmm. And if you carefully yeah. see, you can actually see where the filling in, where the actual liquid comes mm -hmm. in underneath it. And you can have a look around yeah. inside as well, see what actually is mm -hmm. happening, what's in there. Cool. Thank you. Distillation, we're getting things done, we're getting purification. Our stills are very narrow. This is to help with the control weight of oils. Oils will be heavier, they'll have a harder time getting on the neck because the lighter ones got there first. But we, if we go by the system's kind of shape of it, it will have a less harshness, less oil in its presence about the spirit. However, we are battling the spirit half the time in this still shape. We are trying to force them up to, to match the type of whiskey. So this would help with a lot of different ones. We're trying to get that kind of impression, but it doesn't limit us. It doesn't mean this will only ever mean with all our spirits being not oily. Some spirits would be much better with the flavors being oily. I don't think I need to dive into detail about what foods in these are best like that. But it goes up and goes across our line of arm, line of the line of nine, and into our first condenser. Our first condenser, just like the gin, it's got a condenser, and it releases our liquid known as the low wines. The low wines is now concentrated alcohol, no longer safe to drink. This is methanols, etc. So what we want to do, of course, is not drink this, but we do taste check any time that we feel that we need to check that the quality is good. Not a common practice. Not everyone does taste check. No. If someone does, it's like, oh, we'll fix it at the end of the aging. <laughs> We're not about that. We are developing our reputation. We don't have the flexibility of things going maybe fixable later. So what we do, we make sure it's good every single time. Which sounds weird, but it's not, it's not the case for them. And this time we check it carefully. <laughs> so I'm looking like a wee like, pinky tap and then a wee lick, that's it. Any more than that, we you know, kind of endanger in our lives. But the low wines, as it's not safe, and it's also not purified enough, it needs a second distillation, as all Scottish distilleries have two distills. Not two stills, but two distills. It doesn't have to actually have two stills to be, as long as it is distilled twice. Inside our second still, our spirit still, which is 3,750 litres in its capacity. So slightly smaller, which means it's slightly taller in its neck, because it's just, you can notice it carefully. And you'll notice as well, by the windows, it's a lot cleaner. That's because any solids and any colour that is actually in going in of that wash into the wash still will be lost in distillation. Anything that comes out of the wash still, anything that comes out of the spiritual, if it has a colour, something's gone wrong. It should not have a colour. And these are examples of such. So this is little wines, so even at little wines, it still has quite a bit of a yellow tinge to it. And we've got different aspects of the actual what comes out of the spirit still at different stages. It's the exact same process as going again, pretty much. It goes in, goes up, goes across the line once again. But instead of just going into a condenser, it goes into this container directly above the purifier. The purifier has a water jacket around it for its heating to keep the vapors at a vapor temperature. And just as a gin still does, it keeps it hot. It's made out of copper, keeps purification going. It's additional copper contact. You can look upon it in a simple way of being two and a half distillations here, but not two still just to keep it there. It may be slightly experimented with mm -hmm. to see what works best because when we first started we didn't actually use it that much. Mm -hmm. but more recently, the last say year, we've actually been exploring its abilities and functions. Also, its terminology, its name, it will change depending on what you're doing with it. It mm. has a hatch, which uh, the actual device itself can be used in more than just whiskey. So we can use things where you can add other ingredients like cured meats. Mm -hmm. And this is like, I think it's a Spanish drink, I'm not right. sure. Mexican. But, yeah, me mm. thank you. <laughs> uh, I knew that the language was Spanish, so I got yep. that right, so apologies for anyone who's Spanish. Uh, but yeah, so uh, that you can adapt, adapt, but we can do that with this case, that would be an additional ingredient. But our condenser will release our new make, but it is still accompanied by the dangerous, and that's where the spirit safe comes in. So the spirit safe, original purpose, tax control. Alright, but what is happening here, low lines will echo through here. And that's where you can tell if you have a close look. That's a muddy looking bowl. That's to show you how still to be distilled the low lines is. But the heads and the hearts and the tails is what comes through these bowls here. Heads, that's the methanol. Mol the boiling point of methanol is lower than that of ethanol. So that means we know it's going to come out of the still first, out of the condensed first, through our First, we have hydrometers just here, which is used to measure the alcohol content, and we also have thermometers in the system as well to know the temperature as well, so we know what is happening. That's how we do it to get the effect, not to get the heart's natural to be product. And then when the tails is going to be showing itself, 
or water comes on our present and so that our nasty or our nasty unpleasant elements will pass away. So heads, hearts, tails. Which I think is hilarious because you're having a really complex process of what makes it safe to drink to put a lever back for. Which, you know, that's a trick of it. But it's a lot of science, a lot of trial and error of hundreds of years, and also carefully done pulling the lever. Which I've done once, and I felt very excited by it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's how I've done it. And even you can see the ball for the heads and tails is definitely not as clean as this. So even at that point, that, make, that makes sense, but even then, it shows you the cleanness, the cleanse, the purity of the heart itself. And this is also a really an information that's monitored this year. But yeah, so now we're going to go into the final room, our cask room. Right. Welcome to the perfectly named cask room where we keep the cask, but this is not where our casks are stored. Our bonded warehouse is about three times the size of our actual distillery, which is even small for a bonded warehouse. And we'll be having a target, I think it's about 8,000 casks okay. stored, and they're not going to be on their side actually, they're going to be standing, so sorry, they are going to be standing on their side. I don't know which ends, that's, I was going to be palletized, that's not what I was trying to remember. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so they'll, they'll be palletized to help with the space and such. Mm -hmm. Now, this room is a chance for us, of course, to have a wee drink, but to dive into the actual aging and its importance. Aging is great because this is what helps develop character and also finishing. And that's a very important thing to remember, the word finishing. Even though you can have additional finishing from where you're aging bourbon, then you change to sherry, that's sure when you're finishing the cast. It is the cherry on top of what the whiskey is your Sunday, but it shouldn't be dependent on the aging. This is where we kind of dive into it. Aging is important to us, but we don't want it to be our focus. We want to achieve a lot of different things in our whiskey before it gets to the aging. That's why I've been talking about crystal malts, chocolate malts, exploration of peat, the exploration of the types of yeast and beyond, and also the exploration of heritage malts as well. This here is a state. Now it is cut in half, but this is what is the end of this piece of wood that's used for constructing a cask. This is actually sourced from space side. And you'll see here, to get the lighting correct. There we go. Yeah, excellent. We have a dark kind of chocolate kind of colour down the middle. It's called the red line. In America they call it the devil's cut. <laughs> so what happens there is we are charring the inside of a cask so that we gain access to the actual flavour in the wood itself. American oak is high in the yellow. Mm -hmm. Which is great for vanilla essence. You know, it's all about the sweetness. And because you set fire, it cracks because it tightens and it opens it up, but it turns it into a bit of a sponge and it soaks in some of the product. And the Americans call it the devil's cut because it gets taxed. So the angel share is registered for evaporating, it doesn't exist anymore, therefore it doesn't get taxed. But the devil's cut still exists 5% of the first year on average, so it still gets taxed. And this is why Jim Dean have the devil's cut Jim Dean. Mm -hmm. So they can make a bit of money else than they tax. What I've heard, it doesn't make a single bit. But apparently, it's still pretty good whiskey, so that's a win. <laughs> but that's what I've heard. People have different opinions, so it's fine. Now, <coughs> that is but one aspect. The wood, as I said, has got vanilla. It's not the only type of oak we have access to, because we must use oak. It's a brilliant wood. There's been different origins of why we age. Some have basically said that you had to transport the kitchen, you had to transport it in something when you're taking it to your buyer. And the distance was sometimes a formidable length of time. And your transport method was your know, horse and car, if not a bit more elaborate. That's a lot of time, a lot of slow chance of actually things changing. So it knows it had a bit of colour, it tasted different when it first got into the cast. This is where the developing of the cast influence began, as they said in this case. The funny and annoying thing about facts in the world of whiskey and its history, people are usually drinking when they're noting it down. So <laughs> the, the fundamentals of it, is it a fact? It did it actually happen? Yes, a bit blurry. Gin is especially known for these fuzzy facts. When it comes to European casks, such as this one here, which is a port cask, which we have actually used in the past for aging some of our blood, as well as this one, which is the made by Edinburgh Sherry, all also Sherry cask as well. These are Spanish oak. European oak is high in those Christmas spices. Tannins is what gives that kind of influence. So it's cinnamon, and nutmeg, and also great stuff. But we like that. And the made by Edinburgh, which we'll be drinking soon, that uh, influence of that a recipe from the 1800s member has been aged in this very cask, which you'll now get to have a wee smell of. So, I want to have a wee smell of this and also want to bring a drink, grab yourself a drink, which is right next to it. And so, the made bit of which you're drinking of and have a nice smell of the influence of the sherry that we are got aging for it has got some interesting fruitiness from its yeast, the Edinburgh Ale yeast. 
and also some interesting kind of like complexities. It is the most complex of the four new makes that we are at available for online and on Trob, etc. But it is quite a popular favourite. And we've been, actually been exploring cocktails mm -hmm. with the new makes yeah. as well. This one's actually really good, well, pairs really well with the sherry based cocktails. So sure. There's one I named the Scottish Inquisition because it's nearly a bit Spain, uh, Spanish sherry into it. Uh, but yeah, so it's just about this kind of fun you can do with the mix. It's not attached to the restrictions, if you like, that whiskey sometimes has and like all whiskey cocktail. Mm. Because new make cocktail, like mixologists, when we talk to cocktail bars, they're like, ooh, this seems new, this got interesting. They just pay attention to the flavor. They're like, oh, what? this would work great in this. We've got that crystal malt I mentioned earlier. I've talked to people who know their cocktails saying popcorn syrup with this, maybe some milk, and, you know, kind of a Kahlua kind of mix with things like, you know, it'll probably taste like sweet and cinema. You know, like, you know that kind of fun kind of interaction that you can catch with thought cinema would connect to whiskey. It's just that kind of fun you can do in our new mix. It's quite like, great. But yeah, so aging is a lot of fun. However, the world of it has changed, especially since education of how it all works and how the world is changing to adapt and demand. When it comes to trying to think of the best way to do this, yeah, so come over here. So when it comes to this here, the, the devil's cut, the, the access to that flavor, this is great. But the angel share, as we call it, the evaporation that happens every single year, it's different all over the world. This room is cold, not because that room is warm in comparison, when we walk out of it, it's because it's kept cold. Mm -hmm. This is what it would feel like in a modern world. You can't have heating in it because it's away from the natural environment of the country you're in. How it would have aged if it wasn't exposed to heating. So, Angel Share in Scotland is actually pretty good. We're very lucky, our weather's terrible. <laughs> you know? We have a 2% loss because we have a cold, wet climate. Wet meaning not a lot of loss. We lose most of the alcohol, which is 2% per year. When it comes to places like Taiwan, they've had reports as high as 20% apparently. Yeah. That is per year again. So they can't even get to 10 years by that the math of it. So it's all about that careful, what do we do? But they have an advantage over us. Their product will mature faster. So that if they could get to 10 years, it would taste way older than any 10 years we have. But at 50 years, our whiskey is still around. We still have it at 50 years. We will have lost about 65%, but it still exists. But that is the main reason why whiskey will cost a lot at an older age. <laughs> but yeah, so older doesn't mean better. It can, it can mean it's the best whiskey you ever had. Because we're all different, your individuality makes this decision. It could be your product. If you can afford it, even better. If not, sorry. But if you can afford it, feel free to hang out with me sometime because that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so it's all about that kind of exploration. Also, casks of different sizes. We've got a big sherry bottle in the corner, as you said. That is 500 litres. The ratio of wood influence to the product is not going to be as great as a smaller cask, or even a smaller cask than this. An octave, for example. A wine and octave cask is 50, 50 litres. You know, so you can have a much better influence of the wood for the pub. And a recent discovery is that if you fill the cast at a lower ABV, at 60% or less, you have a better influence again as well. There's all these little things you can do to have an impression of older flavours in younger whiskies. And the reason why, the consumer. They want whisky now more than ever. We are not making after a of bullet have had to ration their product to their distributors because they're not making enough difference. Mm -hmm. But it's all about that exposure, so you don't know who is doing what. And the thing is, A should be the guide, and not necessarily brand either, because brand recommendation is by a person's opinion. What should be done above all else is exploring them for themselves. And going up to that whiskey bar and saying the same thing you would do when you walk into any shop. You walk into a shop looking for oranges, you ask for oranges. That's what you do when you walk to the bar. You ask for the flavours you want to taste. You want a sweet whiskey, say vanilla, caramel, toffee, what that. Coffee apple, that's what you say. You want Christmas cake, that's a perfectly valid statement because alcohol is one thing, it's definitely present in cake, at least with my blood mixture. All right? <laughs> when it comes to the fruits, fruits are from the actual previous product sherry, wine, pork. These are fruit based and that can soak into the wood and give influence to our whiskey. When it comes to the spices, European cancer, high in tannins, the cinnamon, the nutmeg, the pork, this is how it works. Many a times I've heard people say it tastes like Christmas cake and it's true. This is what's going to have you looking way more than anything else by following your instincts. So to sum up my advice, to sum up and finish with the tour, it's about being stubborn. It's about following your instincts. It's about being experimental and keeping open-minded and about not listening to anyone else but me. 
<laughs> that's where it's about. about really deciding for yourself, not going with what someone told you. Because it's not going to help. So if you like smoked salmon, probably don't like smoked oysters. That's why I like smoked oysters. I love smoked oysters. My wife hates them. <laughs> <laughs> Which means all smoky whiskies and all smoked oysters are all for me. So it's great. Okay. But yeah, so end of the third thing. So we are actually aging rum in our warehouse mm -hmm. for, uh, for example, in this case, Diamond Distillery in Guyana. And what's really good about this is we get to give quality wood to the rum and make it aged and then have influence mm -hmm. from that rum in that cast that you can then use. And then we've got rum that actually, and it's winning awards for stuff, it's turning heads, the stuff is delicious. Mm -hmm. And yes, some of my training was literally just sitting there for an hour and a half and listening to facts about alcohol and drinking. Perks the job. Uh, but yeah, so it was brilliant and I'm looking really, really forward to it and I'm going to make a mince pie out of tropical fruits with it as well. Because why not? But that's the thing, we're not following any norms. You know, we're actually getting in relationships with rum distilleries getting involved with their product, having good source of wood for aging and thirsty, doing continental rum here, so instead of just doing it in places like Liverpool, which is perfect fine, but we can do it here, where the environment means it'll be just as good, which is great, and we can just have more fun. But no, I do the whole thing actually about some of my channels that you didn't know before, which people like yourself is always a really fun challenge, so I hope it would be spontaneous you didn't know. Yeah. Uh, but no, I really hope you had a great time, most importantly, and I do it. Yes, uh, but, yes. <laughs> but no, uh, if you want to give us a review, that'd be amazing. We would love to hear what you thought of this, guys. If you want to see how amazing and beautiful this room is, that is completely acceptable in the review. If you want to see how amazing and beautiful I am, that is also completely acceptable. <laughs> um, yeah, you may not be able to read the same through that. But Stuart's the main, not me, of course. But <laughs> nonetheless, if you did not enjoy the tour in any way, shape, or form, to the torture of an experience, make sure that the name that you use is not Stuart. On the review, or better yet, don't bother with the review. Like <laughs> um, no, thank you so much, Dave. So after our tour, we did a tasting. We were able to try all the different new makes. That was a very, very interesting experience there. I actually bought all four new makes that are available here in Germany as well now. Flavor matters. I'm going to do blind tasting, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to buy a cask. So that's how impressed I was. Now here we have um, all the new distilleries there in Scotland, except for F Glen Farkless. I have no idea why that was there, but they actually have 50 ppm um, Highland peat there, 63.5%. I really enjoyed my time at Holyrood and it was a fabulous, fabulous tour. Thank you everyone that made it possible.